acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We live in a neighborhood in Scarborough, quite near the General Hospital. And it's a common practice, as in lots of Toronto neighborhoods, I'm sure, that people place at the curbside all sorts of things they want to discard. Furniture, appliances, patio pieces, children's toys, yes, toilets, and sinks. And you name it, you will see it at the curbside. But all those things never stay at the curbside very long. In fact, they're seldom there overnight. For there are people who regularly scout the neighborhood for the pickup of such items. Now, I will make a confession and say that when I'm walking my black Labrador retriever dory, that I have quite an interest in what people place at the curbside. And over the years, I've actually picked up a few pieces. My best finds have been an antique pantry cabinet, which I sanded, a lovely solid maple dresser, a small French provincial sofa table, and an old wooden chest. I brought that old wooden chest to grace this morning, and you'll see that I've placed it before the altar of God, and that it's open and spilling over with things old and new. As such, it represents for me the last of the parables we hear in what Jane Williams describes as a piling up of images of the kingdom in the 13th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Here in this chapter, writes New Testament scholar Raymond Brown, we have two sets of paired parables. In the first set, the mustard seed illustrates the growth and the reach of the kingdom. A tiny little seed becomes a great tree, so great that people can sit under it and find shade from the scorching heat, and birds can find in it a place to build their nests. The yeast illustrates the leavening or the raising of the kingdom. Tiny, tiny little pebbles of yeast mixed in with flour and water cause the dough to become bread. Bread for the body, bread for the soul, bread for the world, bread for the kingdom's provision for one and all. In the second set of paired parables, the treasure hidden in a field, and the pearl of great price. These illustrate the priceless value of the kingdom. It's every grace and goodness by which the world is repaired, healed, and transformed. And all of God's children live in harmony, and together they hold a common respect for our common home, the earth itself. That treasure, that pearl of which Jesus speaks is worth everything. All else pales in comparison to the blessings of the kingdom of heaven. Similarly, the parable of the dragnet, hauling in fish of every kind, can be paired with the parable of the wheat and the weeds growing among it. The fish that are bad in time will be separated from the good, and the weeds will be separated from the wheat. Here we have images of the separation of the unrighteous and the righteous on the day of the Lord's coming 
the day of judgment itself. The last parable in today's pileup, as Jane puts it, is described by some as a summary parable. The kingdom is like a master who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. For me, this little summary parable reminds us that our understanding of the kingdom of heaven is enriched by things old and things new, by texts that have spoken through several millennia of the ancient statutes of the Lord to guide his people. Also texts where we hear the Lord saying to his people, I am about to do a new thing. Can you not perceive it? I'm about to do a new thing. Or from the prophet Joel, the Lord saying, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. The elderly among you shall dream dreams and the young among you shall see visions. Visions and dreams that will take us forward. The Spirit, says Jesus to his disciples, will not only bring to your remembrance all the things that I've taught you, but it will also reveal to you things not yet known. The Spirit will declare to you things that are to come, things old, things new. In this vast store of things old and new, are the poetry and the wisdom literature of the Hebrew scriptures, the teachings of the prophets, the gospel of Jesus, the wonders of Celtic spirituality and orthodox mysteries and indigenous spiritualities, all of which help us to grasp the beauties of the kingdom of heaven to understand them better, to be drawn into them. In this vast store of things old and new is the tradition of the church called common prayer, old and new. And all the praises of the church, its great choral works, its monastic chanting, its mass settings, ancient and modern, and its congregational singing, all of which draws us into a greater understanding of the kingdom we proclaim, a kingdom whose every movement sets and resets and resets and resets and resets the world with melodies of love and hope and gorgeous sweets of mercy and justice. In this vast store, of things old and new are all the signs of our life begun and nurtured in Jesus Christ through word and sacrament, all the signs that mark the deepening of our life in, in Christ, both as individuals and as communities of faith. And in this vast store of things old and new are things that are particularly Anglican, for example, the five marks of mission, embraced by Anglicans of many cultures, nations, and races all over the world. These marks of mission shape the life and witness of the Anglican Communion. They shape the life and witness of the Anglican Church of Canada. They shape the life and witness of the Diocese of Toronto and they shape the life and witness of Grace Church. Here they are, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, to teach, baptize, and nurture people in the faith, to respond to human need by loving service, to transform unjust structures of society, challenging violence of every kind, and pursuing peace and reconciliation and striving to safeguard the integrity of creation, sustaining and renewing the life of the earth. Some churches abbreviate these five marks of mission 
with five words, tell, teach, tend, transform, treasure. These marks of mission are lived out in very particular contexts around the world, political, cultural, social, and theological. Finally, in this vast store of things old and new, things that help us to understand, embrace, and embody the kingdom of Jesus and the values it holds for the world are the cherished remembrances of countless holy women and men. Women and men whose lives have been consecrated to the kingdom of God and its blessings for our world. Now remembered among those holy men and women is Michael Jeffrey Pierce. Archbishop and Primate of our beloved Church from 1986 to 2004. Michael died peacefully this past week, and much can and will be said by a way of grateful remembrance of his thoughtful, courageous, and spirited and patient leadership. At a meeting of General Synod in 1998 in Montreal, Michael shared a deeply personal conviction in his presidential address, and I quote, I believe that no greater sign of life is given to me and to the world than the church, the only legacy of Jesus. I'm committed to its life and its true health, to its internal accountability, and to its external witness. I strive to move the church in championing, particularly all her minorities of age, gender, ethnicity, sexuality, and to work toward that day when the whole church can joyfully make all the difficult and necessary affirmations which spring from the incarnate love of God. Michael Pierce seems to me was like one of those masters of whom Jesus speaks in this summary parable, one who draws out of a vast store of spiritual treasures, things that are old and things that are new things that enrich our life in Christ and our witness, individual and communal, to the kingdom he announces. Today and in coming weeks, a grateful church will remember a faithful servant, a great teacher, and a good shepherd. May it be our joy as we hear this vast pileup of images of the kingdom as we hear this parable of drawing out of deep treasures, things that are old and new, may it be our joy to continue to live and thrive according to those things, old and new, that help us to better live the kingdom we proclaim. Amen.